Welcome, everybody, to this week's episode of the Framework Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Ana Trujillo Limon, and I'm joined with my other host, Jamie Hopkins. Welcome, Jamie. Yeah, thanks, Ana. We're out here at the FPA annual conference, so uh, exciting. Yeah, I'm glad to be out here. We're shooting live out here just on the floor, and lunch is starting, so it's a lively environment. Yes, it very, it very much so <laughs> is. And we're excited to be here with Dan Moisan, who's the incoming chair of CFP board, past president of FPA, all the things, practitioner mm -hmm. editor of the journal, all of the things Dan does the most. <laughs> <laughs> so Dan, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thanks for having me. It is great to be here, not just for this, but in general to be around people again, yeah. right? First time Live since events. before the pandemic, right? For FPA mm -hmm. annual conference? For the annual conference. It's mm -hmm. the first one since the pandemic, yes. Yeah. Where exactly. was the last one? I can't even remember. Right. Isn't it Gosh, part of that COVID fog, right? Oh. Yeah, I think it might have been. Pre yeah. 2019 COVID. Minneapolis. Yeah, is that, that right? That was a fun one. I oh, enjoyed yeah, that one. Absolutely. It was cold. Like, it's not cold in Seattle. I keep dressing like it's cold and then start sweating. And <laughs> I'm from Florida. It feels cold. Uh, I <laughs> bet. Yeah, I but forgot it, about that. It says it's cold, but it's not cold like no. the northeast or mm -hmm. omaha like because it said it was like 34 the other day and i ran in shorts right yeah. and i'm like yeah it's interesting just that whatever yeah. it's the humidity and rain it just feels a little different and yeah. it looks like i i bundled up yesterday because i wanted to ride that big ferris wheel because like the <laughs> little kid in me like came out when i saw that i was like i'm gonna go ride that and i bundled up and i walked over there and i was like just dripping by the time yeah, i was it's, done it's not that biting cold by any stretch <laughs> did yeah. you ride it I did. Oh. I enjoyed it. It was like the views. It was so quiet and it was like oh, meditative. Nice. It, was, it was wonderful. You should do it. It's a beautiful I know area. you haven't had any chance to do anything here yet. <laughs> no, not like yet. Said. So Dan, we always kick off talking about food because we love food here mm -hmm. on Framework. Um, what are some of your favorite foods, things you look forward to eating? Uh, by far, mm -hmm. pizza. Pizza. Mm -hmm. Good classic. So versatile. Mm -hmm. It's got all the food groups, right? It does. <laughs> you know, right. and you could experiment with the whole cheese to sauce ratio, mm -hmm. toppings, different kinds of crust, yeah. Chicago deep dish, you know, classic New York style, <laughs> thin crust. I love it all. It's like you're a pizza connoisseur. Yeah, it's not, it's not good for my waistline, <laughs> but it, it's tasty stuff for sure. Well, so you, you live in Florida, though. Florida is not known for its excellent pizza, though. So. No, but we do have uh, <laughs> a very large population of snowbirds. Yeah. And they come down for the winter. Mm -hmm. And you'll hear things like sports radio talking about hockey, which they don't talk about in Florida until mm -hmm. uh, the winter comes. Uh, and they all bring their favorite styles of pizza. Mm -hmm. They're not going to come down there and spend several months without getting a good <laughs> deep dish or thin crust or whatever it is from wherever they're they're coming from. So. That's yeah, so we get great pizza. Yeah, the uh, so if you had to, do you have a favorite pizza place in the country that if you go to like a city, you know you're going there? Uh, every time I'm in Chicago, I'll go to Alumanados. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, for the deep dish. Um, you know, I, I can't eat more than a couple slices because it's like swallowing a bowling ball. So, yeah, so <laughs> it's like dense. Eating a whole pizza oh, yeah. in its own, just having it's fantastic. a couple of those. Yeah, I remember the very first time I ate it. I was at a conference there, and like. What is it like hot Girardelli or what's it, whatever the other thing you can put in it? But like it weighed like eight pounds, oh, yeah. right? And they were so, like, oh yeah, like have a beer too and then eat this thing. And it yeah. was like, yeah, like yeah. literally like eight pounds of yes. food. <laughs> and it's so dense. And New Yorkers go, it's not real pizza. And I totally understand why they say that because it is completely different. It's 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 more of a, a pie than yeah. even yeah. A, a traditional pizza. For sure. Yeah. So this is an interesting take on this. We were talking, Sarah Kane, who's our VP of coaching, we were uh, at a conference recently. She was saying like her go-to frozen pizza. And I can't even remember <laughs> the brand, but do you have a go-to frozen no, pizza when you can't? No, oh. I like a hot audio. Oh, okay, like, stuff, I don't mess you know? with that fake stuff. <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. No, I think some frozen pizzas are okay. But yeah, we're not a, we, I live in Philly. We don't do frozen pizzas yeah. either. Yeah. We're a pretty good Italian background yeah. place for pizza. So. Uh, so what's uh, do you have a first money memory? This is another question. It's yeah, always fun. I, I, one of my first money memories was my grandfather stashing cash in his sofa, mm. in the cushions of the sofa, like you know, unzipping un them. And, yeah, yeah. yeah and he, he's Detroit. He grew up during the Depression. He remembers the run of the banks and how his parents reacted to all that. And uh, until the day he died, he had a little cash stashed somewhere, which is <laughs> concerning as he got older. <laughs> Uh, for a lot of reasons, but uh, yeah, that was uh, that was one of my very first money memories. Okay. Yeah. So Dan, tell us about your journey into this profession. Yeah, so I got out of college and I went and moved. I graduated from uh, Florida State mm -hmm. in Tallahassee. I love you anyway. 
dining. <laughs> <laughs> What's well, one of the top three schools in Leon County, Florida, Anna? For well, sure. I, I'm easily. a Miami Hurricane, so <laughs> sworn enemies and rivals. <laughs> yes, well, they made us smile this year on the football field, but that's a whole other, whole that's other a whole thing. Other, that's a whole other episode. Yes, <laughs> college football is like a religion down in the south. So, um, but I went up and moved to North Carolina. I mm-hmm. uh, needed a job. Uh, I graduated with a degree in finance, uh, and I. I, I was always attracted to the, the more personal side of finance rather than the corporate stuff. Mm-hmm. Corporate stuff was interesting, but it wasn't as interesting as the, the finance uh, personal side. And, you know, I needed a job. So I went and I sold life insurance as a 23-year-old kid to tobacco farmers in rural eastern North Carolina, mm-hmm. um, which did not go well. Yeah. No. <laughs> um, um, I learned a lot, though. I learned I like deer meat biscuits and collard greens and fell in love with Carolina barbecue, probably my second favorite <laughs> food. Um, but along the way selling the insurance, I stumbled across uh, a couple that had a financial plan. And it was one of those, you know, 50 pages yeah, worth of stuff, and right? And kind of like a faux leather <laughs> thing. And it was from a company that's back uh, like 1990, 91-ish, uh, a company called IDS. Uh, and within a few years, I approached them and said, you need to hire me. And they're like, well, we got nothing better to do, so we'll give the kid a chance. And I survived long enough. Um, and I was lucky to have mentors that really understood the power of real financial planning, right? Getting your head around all of the different aspects of personal finance and how they integrate, how they coordinate. And I was hooked. And, um, you know, one thing leads to another. And. Uh, I'd moved up there chasing after my girlfriend, <laughs> who I dated in high school, <laughs> and we did get married. Right. Um, and we started talking about you know where to raise kids, and so we moved to Florida. And one thing leads to another, and eventually, IDS became America Express Financial Advisors. Uh, I left there and affiliated with uh, LPL, mm-hmm. which at the time their chairman, um, Todd Robinson, was uh, he was a current or chat or recent past chair of NASDR. So they ran a really tight compliance ship, which I thought was very important. Set up a state registered RIA to do the planning, did that for a few years, and then eventually cut all ties with the broker dealer world, went fee only uh, RIA in uh, 2000. So it's a, it's a small incremental progression of um, trying to figure, I knew I figured out what I wanted to do fairly early on and then it was where to do it. And there just weren't any oppor- that many opportunities. So I kind of had to create a for myself, which is common for us gray-haired guys to tell you stories like that. Right? There was no, there was no, there was no uh, firm already in existence that would hire kids out of college for you yeah. know a, a livable planning salary, and... and just to do planning and planning support. Um, so thank, thank goodness there, there is that now. Well, Ron's told me the one story about LPL back in the day too, which he said they threw a party when he hit 25 million under advisory there you right go. like lpl yeah. said it like could right like you know back in the, whatever it was like 94 or something it was yeah. like the first guy ever to hit like 25 million in yep. advisory and, yep. you know nowadays it's like oh like yeah there's yeah. everybody here <laughs> right. yeah i mean it's it's incredible how that happens and you, you kind of make fun of them with clients sometimes so they'll tell you you know if i could just get two million then i could retire and i'll feel yeah. good they get to two and it's like well if i could just get to three you know yeah and you go through a similar process uh, when growing your business. I remember my current partners and I talked about, you know, once we get to 100 million, I think we'll be we'll be in good shape. And then you get there and you're like, you know, once we get to 200, then we'll really be. Yeah. And it's it's <laughs> always something. Else. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think if you have that mindset where you're always looking to grow and grow mm-hmm. responsibly, I, I think that really helps because yeah. if, if you're if you're not constantly trying to improve and make things better for your clients and your employees uh, and yourself, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you rust, your rust. Yeah. So. Well, and I think the one around dollars is I always say there's, there's never enough of a dollar, right. right? Like, so if you want to save X amount or you want to grow X bit, like there's never enough, right? No. So if you just chase that and your point, like growing responsibly and what's the impact, like that number will always move, right? Forever. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. So Dan, since we are here at the FPA annual conference, I was wanting to know about FPA. What ha- what role has it played in your career, and why do you give back to it and serve in, in such a capacity as you have as past president and journal practitioner editor and things like that? Yeah. Uh, well, 
Those are two separate questions. Yeah. So I'll start with, <laughs> start with what has FPA done for me? Uh, there is absolutely no doubt in my mind that I would not have the business that I have and, or the life, quite frankly, that I have, because that business really su supports a lot of things, if I weren't a member of FBA. Mm -hmm. um, you have to crawl out of your cave every now and then mm -hmm. and take a look around at what else is going on in the world. And that was, that was there were a lot of great things came from my experience with IDS America Express and even, even LPL to a degree. Um, but there's a certain insular aspect to that, right? Mm -hmm. You tend to go to the America Express meetings or the LPL meetings and everybody there is kind of in a very, very similar boat serving very similar clientele. Mm -hmm. And when you come to an event and become a member of FPA and you start to network and really hang out with other financial planners, you start to realize the diversity that's out there with respect to who they're serving, how they're going about doing it, what's important to them and their businesses. And I, I remember going to my first ICFP conference, right? One of the predecessor organizations, the Institute of Certified Financial Planners. And I'm sitting at this table and I'm listening to Harold Levensky talk mm -hmm. and all these other people. And I'm just a sponge, man, just bringing it all in, listening. And, at, you know, I didn't like everything that they said, mm -hmm. but that it was very clear they had thought through these things very deeply in a 360 degree way. And we're sharing it so that I would be able to do the same thing and try to figure out what was right for me and how I wanted to go yeah. about conducting my business. And you just, you can't get that reading magazine articles or blog posts. You have to get out and meet people and talk to them and have a beer or a Diet Coke or whatever, whatever you fancy um, and, and spend some time really talking to them. And then from that, the network expands, right? And it's just became more and more and I was more appreciative of it. I've always been one that um, understands that I'm drinking from wells I didn't dig and I'm resting in the shade of trees I didn't plant. And things are the way they are because somebody else put a lot of sweat equity into it and I wanted to do that as well. So um, the reason I get involved and I'm kind of a serial volunteer is I just can't help myself. There's always something interesting going on, somebody that needs help. And if I see an opportunity to step in and do that, I I'm, gonna, I'm gonna offer myself to do that. So let me ask you a little bit about like setting that seed um, to grow your business too. You talked about growth in there, and I'd love to know like what's one thing that you know you did that you think really led to some of that framework of success of your business because it did grow and it you then you had as you said the a lifestyle to be actually be able to give back. Um, is there anything that sticks out in your mind of like building the practice and the business over time that you would share? Yeah, it sounds real. It can sound extremely trite or cliched, but it really starts with just doing the absolute best that you can for clients and doing it in a way where they can see and, and, and feel that you really care about their financial well-being. And, you know, sometimes you feel like you care about their finances more than they do. Sometimes. <laughs> you know, that's true too. Yeah. But uh, you know, my, my father-in-law was a dentist and, and he'd say all the time, it, it, it's, it is a cliche, right? People don't know, care what you know until they know you care. But mm -hmm. it's absolutely, it's a yeah. cliche because it's true. Mm -hmm. And when you take the time to when somebody doesn't, you know, they just kind of have that look in their eye like they didn't quite get what you said, mm -hmm. you know, it'd be real tempting just to move on, get the meeting over and get on to the next thing. Yeah. You take the time and you say, let me try that again, you know, uh, and, and really walk them through things and then... That, to me, that's one of the great thrills of the job is when all of a sudden the lights kind of come on. You know, their eyes get bright and they realize what you're telling them is good for them and why. And they feel really confident about the decision that they're going to make. I mean, that's gold. That's just, it's very addictive to me anyway. Yeah, I think that that I was talking with somebody standing right here like an hour ago about how people make decisions, right? And that does this person care about me part and trying to make the world better is such a key part of the decision process. Yeah. And usually for advisors, one of the decisions is like, can like, is the person smart? Well, for the most time, people check that for dentists and CFPs. <laughs> like there's some level we just kind of move through. Like they know in their domain, right? Yeah. yeah. And I think we spend too much time trying to explain that sometimes the client, like, let me show you that I'm smart. Well, like if you already did a couple of basic things, like they're moving past that one pretty quickly. And we're trying to get that, do they care about me face? Yes, yes, very true. And the smart thing really cracks me up because I live in Melbourne, Florida, which is the Space Coast. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so 
our area code is three, two, one, right? Yep. A lot of my clients are actual rocket scientists. <laughs> so you better not go into those meetings thinking you're the smartest guy in the room because you are not, you know? Uh, but I do have expertise that they don't have. And uh, I think that's one of the other elements to growing a business is you have to be smart enough to realize you can't be great at everything. And frankly, you shouldn't even try. Yeah. You got to surround yourself with other talented people that want to serve clients the way you do and leverage your skills. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that's, that's slow. When you're first starting out and you don't have many clients, it's real hard to bring people in to help you out. But uh, it does, it does, once it starts to get traction, there is a, an exponential uh, degree of growth, even if it's not financial, just on how you yeah. use your time. Mm -hmm. Did they just do a, a launch there again? for Because the, they hadn't done a launch in a while down there, one of the rockets, right? But recently they did one, we right? Are, we're launching three, like, four times a month something. That's awesome. From yeah. Starlink satellites. The Orion uh, spacecraft just came back from a trip around the moon. Ah, splashed down cool. the Pacific just yesterday or day before. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're putting stuff up all the time. <laughs> and it's... You, you kind of take it for granted because I've seen so many launches, but every time one's going on, you just stop and you you watch, and then that rumble comes, and you can feel yeah. it in your chest, and the windows shake a little bit, and yeah. it's like, man, that is awesome. Yeah, if you that haven't really experienced cool. it, and it like I hits never... the sound barrier or whatever, and some atmosphere thing, and it gives this boom, oh. and it like all the everywhere. Yeah, it's we had awesome. one, we had one at two thirty in the morning uh, last week. Actually, <laughs> yeah, some framework. booster rockets came back. Yeah, yeah it's. <laughs> It's incredible. And, you know, you get all wrapped up in your Monte Carlo simulations. <laughs> you should see the simulations those guys yeah. do. I mean, she even impresses. <laughs> you know? So, yeah. Dan, um, here we just saw Camila Elliott pass by not yes, too long ago. Yeah, wave yeah, to yeah, us. Yeah, um, so, so I know, you know, Camila, this is her, her year as chair of CFP board, but you're yeah. coming on um, yeah. after her. So talk to us a little bit about what your goals for CFP board are for the next year when you're chair and what you hope to get accomplished. Yeah, I get that question a lot. Yeah. And it, it's a little um, odd because um, one of the things about volunteer leadership mm -hmm. is you're a temp. Yeah. You're only there for a short period mm -hmm. of time. And you end up very often, I say this a lot, finishing things other people start mm -hmm. and starting things other people are going to have to finish. And you've got to go into the job not thinking about how am I going to make my mark, what's my legacy going to be. Um, you've got to go in there and think how do I keep this, this moving uh -huh. along well and show a very healthy level of respect for the people that came before you and the people that are going to mm -hmm. have to come after you because you don't even know who they are. Mm -hmm. You know you know who was there before you. You don't know who's coming next. So, and then with Camila too, it's she's man she's awesome yeah she is we had her on she, the show not too long ago wonderful yeah i uh, yeah I, i'm seeing you at the diversity summit mm -hmm. and i've been around a lot of volunteer leaders in the last 30 years a lot of them and i put her up there with all of them all the best of the best she's just incredible so I, it's kind of silly for me to try to think how, you know how am i gonna <laughs> step into those shoes because I don't wear heels, one, <laughs> but um, good point. I can't do that. I can't do that. But I, you know, I can make an impact in other ways. I can keep things on the train. And one of my goals for the year is to do what I can because there's a lot of misunderstanding out there about what CFP is doing mm -hmm. and some of the things that they're not doing. Mm -hmm. um, because you know, we have, we have a little bit of a trade press that likes to you know, write things, and uh, everybody's entitled to their opinion these days. And yeah. You know, they're up all over the place and not all of them are with actual facts or logic or <laughs> any of that. And you have to kind of counter that. So I, I want to I want to be as um, available as I can be uh, to CFP certificates and candidates and um, everybody to try to try to help them understand what it is that, that, that we're, we're doing and why we're doing it the way we're doing it. Well, I think we officially have press bass badges here so like yeah. we fall now into that press so if there's yeah. anything uh, you need to clarify yes. for the world, <laughs> uh, 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 <laughs> so I, I have two questions here around the volunteer part because i just am wrapping one up myself right now um which is like have you thought about so this is something i wish it, so i sat on the national trustee board for nafa the mm. recently Great group. i'm wrapping up yep. here soon and one thing though similar right like you take on things that the past board did and then you're trying to put yourself in as you're leaving but i would say it took me nine months before i felt like i knew what i needed to like just bring up and i look back and i was like i should have done more kind of like pre-work like i should have two days where you just 
download everything because it's kind of like I pick up this conversation, you're in this meeting, you do this like committee thing. And it took a long time just to get up to speed. Yeah. But it, I, I look back at that. And I'm like, but it didn't need to be that way. Like we could have streamlined that. And I brought that up. Like the next group should have like two days where they just understand the business. Cause you might know the impact that a place is having, but you don't know the business side of it. Like, Oh, like that's why this internal system and Oh, they don't have KPIs here. So oh, we need KPIs here. And so there's some things like that, that, you know, I think probably most volunteer boards struggle with. You know, I was at American College for seven years. We did not do a good job of onboarding people. It might take somebody two years to figure yeah. out everything that you're doing. Yeah. And, yeah, it's a very interesting dynamic. Yeah, so at CFP Board, we actually have a two-day board orientation mm -hmm. that's live and in person, and all of the different staff mm -hmm. folks come in, and they, they, they help people with that. It's particularly difficult um, for uh, the public members, and we have a mandate to have a minimum number of, of public members on that mm -hmm. board. Um, so, you know, a person who uh, l likes what we're doing and what our mission is and all that will come on the board, but they don't really understand the ecosystem is the word that's used a lot. Yeah. Uh, and it will take them a while for them to kind of get their heads around that. But as far as the operations of the organization go, um, they'll know it pretty well when they leave there. Yeah. Now, it might, you know, it might not <laughs> stick too good, but they know kind of where to go. Yeah. And, and we're continually in a supportive mode to try to keep them up to speed. Mm -hmm. yep. That's great. It's great to see that structure in place. Um, you mentioned the one thing about maybe telling people about things that uh, aren't true. Um, what do you think is one thing in this profession that's not going to change over the next five to ten years? Demand is going up. Um, the world of personal finance is complex, and it's only getting more complex. Uh, in my 30 years or so doing this, it's never gotten less complex really in very many um, areas of a person's finance at all. I mean, you think about credit, investments, um, you know, insurances, retirement planning, estate planning, it just gets more and more complex all the time. Uh, so I, I don't see that changing mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. I think the demand's just gonna get greater and greater. That's awesome. Do you think the delivery is gonna change too? Yeah, uh, so, you know, most, Financial planning has been done for, and it, it kind of makes sense on one level, people with money, for a lack of a better way to put it, uh, rather than people that are trying to accumulate some money. Um, but there's, there's been a lot of in, innovation, I think, uh, particularly with compensation models that do open the door to serving a clientele that has not accumulated assets. And uh, because their needs are different, because their stage of life is different, I think it makes perfect sense that del delivery methods will all, will change also um how that's going to look exactly i don't know but yeah. i mean that's the beauty of uh, i mean that's the beauty of financial planning it does adapt the first year i was in business we would print off like a hypothetical of what an investment would accumulate to you know over a period yeah. of time we'd hit print we'd go to lunch and the dot matrix thing would still <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I sound like my dad when i say that oh, back when i was it's was all tough and we uphill the snow both ways and all that garbage but it's true. I mean, uh, it, technology has continued to evolve and evolve and evolve, and I think that'll be a big part of whatever the delivery mechanism is going forward. It's not a replacement for humans, because quite frankly, technology doesn't care. <laughs> it just crunches numbers. It doesn't know anything about you. It doesn't <laughs> care about you a lick, you know? And people want to be cared for. Ah. Well, Dan, this has been wonderful catching up with you and seeing you again for the second time yeah, this year after yeah. so many years, that, after yeah. this whole pandemic. Yeah. Um, but we always like to ask, what does finding your freedom mean to you? I, it, to me, it just means being able to make more decisions about how I spend my time, mm -hmm. who I spend it with. Yep. Um, you know, we don't all have choices on how we spend every single moment of every day, but uh, I feel fortunate to be able to choose most of those moments most days for that's myself. Good. So that, right. to me, that's freedom. Do you want to do a speed round again? Go for it, Jamie. You want to do one this time too? Oh, you, uh, could, you can do the third one. Oh, I'll do two, then you nervous. go. <laughs> okay. All right. So speed round. I'll hit you with yeah. an easy one speed first. Round. So, uh, best <laughs> book you've read in the last year or so? I have not read a complete book in the last year. Okay. What book immediately comes to mind? <laughs> yeah, if you think of a book that has it had an impact on you, then. Um. A book that's had an impact. It doesn't on... even have to be a financial book. No, it wouldn't yeah. be a financial book. I don't read many of those. <laughs> Uh, I read a lot of magazine articles because okay. I have a, How about a, a movie. Short Are you a movie span. guy? 
No, I haven't even been to movies. Yeah. What happens when you get older is you get yeah. to a point where pop culture just disappears. Disappears. Yes. All right. Yes. So we got no books, no movies, <laughs> magazine. Uh, best article that comes to mind. What did you read that was interesting to you? God. Come on, you got to have one. Some Montgomery Warshower research. Yeah, <laughs> right. Some research from the yeah. Journal of Financial <laughs> Planning. I do read a lot of that. Okay. Yes. I Does, do read a lot of that. Did I you that. learn one this? What did you learn about financial planning then from that in the last year or so? Uh, the most recent one that, that I've been thinking about uh, is a new one from David Blanchett, who's yeah. a, a serial stud in that area, right? Mm -hmm. um, on uh, different ways to approach the re retirement income policy. Well, most of my clients are about to be retired or retired, so that's right yeah. up my, uh, my alley. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. that's a good one. So yeah. David Blanchett does great research. Oh, yeah, totally. One of the best. Uh, so I'm going to go to this one. Which is, what's the best gift you've ever given to someone? You're taking all of them, Jamie. You <laughs> took all three. <laughs> no, he didn't. Like, I, we didn't get good answers in the first one, so I'm doing yeah, one. I know. Best gift you've ever given. The best gift I've ever given. I got my wife a necklace mm -hmm. that she saw in a window when we were on vacation in Hawaii oh, about gosh. 10 years ago and had it delivered to the table oh. at dinner. Total surprise. She is really, really tough to surprise. Because she doesn't like to be surprised, mm -hmm. yeah. and she just asked. She's she's HR trained interviewer. I mean, I can't get away with anything. Yeah. And uh, yeah, she's she was very persistent on that. But I, I got her that time. That's awesome. All right. Oh gosh, my rapid fire question. I I well I let's switch it up. And what's the best gift you've ever received, and why? Ooh, that's a tough one. Um, that would be a tough one for me too. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's probably one I've received many, many times. I don't know why this is, but the hit rate's very, very high. That when I'm having a particularly exhausting day, I, I don't say a word and somehow my wife knows and she's got something nice to eat. She's got a little music playing, a little glass of wine, just chill. Yeah. You know, I don't know, I don't know why that is, but she seems to have a sixth sense about that for some reason. So and I've, I've received that. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah, well, she's a keeper. You've been I've known school her since we were 12. Yeah, oh, so I it's, love it's, high yeah. school sweetheart. Yeah, <laughs> so rare. 31 years in a row here, married. So. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, I, it seems like you made a good decision there. Absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> Well, Dan, thank you again so thank much you. for joining us. Thank you, Jamie. As always, you're awesome. And thank you all for tuning into this week's episode. And don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an episode.